recording. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm your teacher, Barry Bostain. I'm sure a lot of you know me already. I'm sure a lot of you are taking my classes before. So this is the uh, first quarter we're gonna do, uh, I guess YouTube classes, kind of online. So let me introduce the class first. All right, this is Inter International University of the East, in case you don't know which school that you enrolled in, okay? Uh, the code course number is HIAS 101. The class title is United States History through 1876. And this is spring quarter 2020, okay? And this should be uh, Monday uh, class should be a Monday class, I think it's afternoon. Okay, so I'll read the uh, reading or lecture material, but I've set up a PowerPoint so that you can follow along and read with me, and then I'll devise the questions from the reading, okay? And uh, hopefully we can uh, learn in this class and enjoy it, okay? As you can see my screen, I'm uh, doing the class from Jejudo in Korea. That's where I'm at right now. So uh, if you believe me, I have some uh, swamp land I can sell you. So uh, enough said on that. So let me try to go to the reading material here and share the screen with you. All right. Okay, again. Uh, here's the course number, HIS 101, United States History through 1876. Okay, so you can see my face minimized, because uh, you, you don't need a big shot of my face, you need a big shot of the material. So I'll read it and translate things and add antidotes to it so you understand it really well and uh, hopefully enjoy it, okay? All right, so let's continue. Again, that's week one. Okay, so we're starting here. Uncovering the existence of the new world. And that's what Europeans called uh, America. There was no United States at the time. It was a whole new world to them, even though there were, they would find out that there were native people living here. Uh, but most of it was empty. So it was called the new world. So we start here by the time Christopher Columbus, I'm sure everybody knows him, we have uh, the Christopher Columbus holiday. So Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. So you come from Europe directly across, that is the Atlantic Ocean. The civilizations on the American continent, and that includes South America, right? There's a North and South America, were already centuries old. So they're going to be talking there about people that you might know in history, like Aztec people, Mayan people, uh, down south like Peru, uh, you had Incan people. So uh, there were people, and then of course the American natives here, uh, Apaches, Cherokees, uh, and the East Coast, uh, Mohicans. So uh, those are the civilizations that were already centuries old here. So continuing, so it makes less sense to say that Columbus discovered a new world than to say he uncovered a very old one, right? Which is really the, the, the uh, truth of the matter. As you read in chapter one, he was not even the first European to set foot in the Americas. And this chapter further explores the events and consequences of Columbus's uncovering. Uh, yeah, ever since I was a kid, they found out uh, new things like uh, probably Vikings were here from, you know, Norway, way before Columbus. They found coins and writings. There's a possibility that even uh, Chinese were here. So the further we go along and find things, you'll see that he probably was not actually the first one that arrived. But at least he's the first one that stayed and established a new kind of civilization. So again, a new world. 
When uncovering of America is mentioned, Christopher Columbus immediately comes to mind. The Explorer even has an official national holiday on the calendar and scores of parades that celebrate his uncovery. Be careful, I might put that question on the midterm. I might say, hey, what day is Columbus Day? So be careful. And if you say, well, it wasn't in the reading, I'm telling you right now. So that might happen. Okay, easy points, easy points. Uh, Columbus is so significant in history that historians use his accomplishments to divide history into eras, making the time before 1492, when he arrived, pre-Columbian. Okay, so those are different time frames, right? And the big era before his arrival in 1492 was pre-Columbian. Okay, so just a little uh, teaser question here. Um, how many national holidays honor the name of an individual American? Okay. President's Day is celebrated in February to honor two presidents, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. The holiday is celebrated in the United States on the third Monday in February. Since become, uh, becoming known as President's Day in 1971, the only two national holidays that honor an individual's name are Columbus Day and Martin Luther King's birthday. Uh, the sad point about this is that a lot of uh, folks, uh, I'm told, when they changed this in 71, there were already two holidays. One was for George Washington and one was for Abraham Lincoln. They were separated. And then when people voted to have a holiday for Martin Luther King, and rightfully so, American people were excited they were gonna have another extra holiday. They were hoping for a Martin Luther King holiday in March so that they'd have a holiday in each month, January, February, and March. Unfortunately, the government thought that would be too many holidays. So they put Washington's and Lincoln's together and then just put Martin Luther King to fill the other spot. So we're still winding up with two, unfortunately, uh, instead of a new third one. So I don't know, it's a sad thing, but uh, that's the way they did it. So, okay, I'm gonna move to the next page. Okay, um, there are some who consider this recognition misplaced as his attempts to reach the Far East were unsuccessful. Okay. What they mean by that is, and you'll see as we read the material, uh, his original attempt was to find India, right? He was looking to go to India and possibly China, but he got lost. He did not make it around the Horn of Africa. Instead, sailed the complete Atlantic Ocean up until our continent over here. So that's why people say, well, he didn't really go where he was supposed to go. But that's, that's one group of people's argument. So continuing, yet many people feel that celebration is appropriate when one considers in the words of J.H. Perry, don't worry, you don't have to remember this name for your test, an authority of Spanish explorers that Columbus did not discover a new world. He established contact between two worlds, both already old. And that has a lot of truth to it also, but that sounds a little, that's a little stretched because that would mean that there was only uh, one group of people uh, as you see when he arrives in the Caribbean islands and Latin America, that's not true. There was many, many groups of people. So you could also say that there was a lot of uh, new worlds or small worlds. But again, uh, historians will, will debate different things and each have different beliefs. 
Okay, so Christopher Columbus was born near Genoa in Northern Italy in 1451. Uh, so realize that a lot of people think Christopher Columbus was Spanish, but he was actually Italian. And you'll find out why people thought he was Spanish. We'll understand that next, but he was actually an Italian. Uh, young Columbus began his seafaring career shortly after Portuguese navigators reached Cape Verde Islands off the West Coast in Africa. So if you know your locations, um, the African continent is underneath the European continent. And people, went around there. Navigators are uh, people that go out to sea and travel out to sea. So they traveled all the way to Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa. So again, you realize Christopher Lomas got lost and wound up all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. A few years later, he sailed commercial routes between Genoa and other Mediterranean ports before voyages to the Aegean island of Chios, near what is now Turkey. England, the Portuguese island of Madeira, and Guinea on uh, Western Africa's west coast. So again, you see, you're gonna have to round off, go completely around the Horn of Africa, and then you, you'll be winding up in uh, India. So uh, in between these journeys, he married and became a father. We have a little title here, Columbus had a hunch. I don't know if you know what that means, hunch. Hunch is a slang word. It means uh, we call a gut feeling or intuition, a feeling in your stomach. So even though he went by Portuguese navigators and precise maps, he also did things with just his intuition or feeling. So this uh, includes his dream and you'll see who he asked for help here. So Columbus had a hunch around 1483. Columbus went to King John II of Portugal for endorsement of his plan to discover a new route to Asia by sailing west. So you see here, he wanted to take a new route. He thought maybe it could be a shortcut sailing uh, to Asia. Okay. Uh, there was a big word there, endorsement. That just means when someone, that's a high level word for someone or usually a government agency. And like this was the king. So endorsement says giving you the okay, giving you the permission uh, to do something, right? which also means he needs money to do it. He doesn't have the money himself. But the glory will go to uh, King John II of Portugal if Christopher Columbus is uh, successful. Uh, so back to the reading. Uh, Asia was the place to get what everyone wanted back then, spices. Uh, these were not simply the mildly aromatic pleasures that enhanced flavors. Spices were essential for preserving food. Okay. If you were here in front of me, I'd ask you, what, why do you think they needed spices to preserve food? The reason is they did not have any refrigeration. So in Europe at the time, a lot of people were eating meat that was too old. They were getting sick. But if you had these strong spices uh, that came from the East, curry, turmeric, uh, those kinds of powders, um, they would in, not only enhance or give the food a better flavor, but they could keep it fresh longer. And that's the only way you could do it at that time because there was no refrigeration. So if your meat went bad, your steak, in three days, you could put spices on it, again, without refrigerating it, right? You just leave it out in the open air. Uh, it could maybe make it last another three days, right? And, uh, so it wasn't only the flavor, but the preserving of their meats. As I continue, but King John II rejected Columbus's petition. Petition meaning his request. 
please give me permission to do this. Uh, by 1485, and now a widower, which means his wife uh, died, Columbus moved with his son to Spain. Uh, persistent as ever, which means he didn't stop trying, he presented a plan uh, the following year to Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, the king and the queen and king of Spain. So that's where you get the connection that most people, since he got permission from the king and queen of Spain, and his name sounds Spanish, he must have been Spanish, but actually he was Italian. Again, Columbus was refused. However, four years later, 1489, Queen Isabella listened to Columbus again. He left their meeting with hopes of organizing a future expedition once Spain's war with the Moors was over. And the Moors, if you don't know, were the Arabs coming up from the northern part of Africa. And they had uh, conquered and ruled Spain for quite a long time. So I guess Queen Isabella didn't have money to give him until they actually got their independence uh, from the Moors, okay? And I'm on the bottom here. It is often believed that Columbus had to work hard to convince the king and queen as well as his crew that Earth is spherical rather than flat. Spherical is a big word meaning round. Again, if you don't know at the time with the maps from Europe, they felt that the earth was flat and that if you sailed your ship too far, like what Christopher Columbus eventually did being lost going across the Atlantic, your ship would fall off the end of the earth. Uh, but he felt that possibly the earth was actually round. So that would be an impossibility, but they did believe that the earth was flat at the time. In case you didn't know that. However, at the end of, I'll be clicking here, at the end of the 15th century, the idea of a round world was not a new concept. Uh, even some ancient Greece, Greeks, such as Aristotle, were aware of Earth's roundness. Okay, and then we have ready, set, sail. And uh, two years passed with no development. So remember, he waited four, and now he's waiting another two. Uh, Columbus grew frustrated with the delays and even prepared to leave Spain. Eventually, he was summoned or called forth by Queen Isabella who gave him the assurances he needed, basically giving him the okay. Sure enough, the Moors surrendered in 1492 and the Spanish sovereigns, meaning their kings and queen, approved Columbus's expedition to find a Western route to Asia on behalf of Spain. Again, meaning that any glory or gold would be given credit to Spain. That's why they're paying him to do that. It wouldn't technically belong to Christopher Columbus. Uh, preparations in the Spanish port of Palos began in May with the requisitioning of three ships. And by August, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria set sail. The expedition was financed in part by royal money granted by the king and queen, as well as Columbus's own private funding. So he also spent money on this expedition. Question here, what was in it for Columbus? The seafarer was commissioned with the promise that he would receive one-tenth, uh, again, he would receive one-tenth of the profits of the expedition. And he was granted, okay. So I'll stop there. Well, I'll read the by you, it's not gonna be enough question. He was granted several titles, including Admiral of the Ocean Sea, Viceroy, and Governor of whatever lands he received. 
Okay, from the reading so far, I'm going to uh, go into another mode here and then write the questions for you. I will also tell you the questions because you need to answer these questions and uh, I'll have to go over your answers next week, okay, the second week. And then from these questions, uh, they will appear on the midterm, yeah, fifth week, okay? So. There I am again. So I'm going to go to what is called the whiteboard. And I'm going to write the questions from the reading so far. All right, so I'm going to write the first question. So the first question is, in 1483, who did Columbus ask to endorse his plan to sail to Asia? So remember, he had to ask somebody that had power and money to fund. Even though he used some of his money, he could not afford a full expedition, right? With uh, the three ships that he needed. So he asked somebody with a lot of uh, power. So you should be able to guess who those people are. It's in the reading. Okay, I'm gonna do question number two. Okay, question number two is, what did Europeans want from Asia at this time? Okay, and this is a two-parter, so don't forget the little uh, one at the end. This happens sometimes on your test. I'll do it on the test and you'll only answer the first part. So get in a good habit of answering uh, the complete question even when there's an, an add-on, okay? so. What did Europeans want from Asia at this time? Uh, what do you think they wanted? Uh, boba tea? Is that what they wanted at the time? Or uh, hot pot? I don't think so. These things were not invented yet. So uh, <laughs> don't put something like that if you're just not following along. So they wanted things that they needed. They were important for uh, certain reasons. That's why it's a two-parter, okay? So let me put the last question for the our reading so far. Okay, question three. Uh, what were the names of his ships? And then I'll add another addendum there. Okay, how many were there? Was there 26? Was there 50? Was there 100 ships that went to the New World? Okay, and then what were the names of the ships? 
So if you're thinking something in Spanish, please don't give me something like Taco Bell or, uh, you know, Del Taco. One, one ship was Del Taco, the other one was Taco Bell. No, okay. The names were in Spanish, but uh, they were names. I'll give you one more hint. Um, female names, right? Because the females were considered to have uh, good luck. Okay. So those are your three questions for the reading up to now. So I will continue with the reading. And then when I reach a certain uh, spot, I will write the next uh, questions for you. Okay. All right. So make sure you write those down because I'm going to erase these and I'll have to write the other one. So. See him erasing them, so. Okay, like I said, I minimize my face. It's more important you see the reading material, okay? So uh, I'm gonna continue the reading. Again, what I read last on the bottom was he was granted several titles, including Admiral of the Sea, and uh, viceroy and governor of whatever lands he discovered. So as I continue on to the right, Ferdinand and Isabella had promised that the first man to sight land would get a yearly pension of 10,000 maravedis, which are Spanish gold coins. Okay. Hopefully you remember, Who's Ferdinand and Isabella? Were they his brother and sister? Hopefully you remember who they were. So um, how that worked uh, is as the ship or ships are at, are at sea, right? Many times it's very cloudy or the land is far off. But the first man that would see land, he had to call out and say, land ho, I see land. And then Columbus would get out his handheld uh, mini telescope and look, and if it's true that there was land, then that person, that sailor, would receive uh, a yearly pension of 10,000 maravedis or Spanish gold coins. Okay. Next. A few hours after midnight on October 12th, 1492, Juan Rodriguez Bermeo, a lookout on the Pinta, spotted what was most likely an island of the Bahamas. So like I told you earlier, he came into what is now the Caribbean area. That's where he arrived first. And the Bahamas is in the Caribbean. But Columbus claimed to have spied land first and collected the reward himself. So that's the usual thing. Uh, lower worker claims something or actually does something, but the boss or supervisor takes the credit. So you can see here with Columbus, it's no difference, right? Okay. Continuing. And over the horizon they went. After taking on supplies in the Canary Islands, the Canary Islands are, they belong to Spain. Uh, they're off the coast of Spain. And sailing over the vast sea on October 12, 1492, crew members of the Santa Maria sighted land. The natives they encountered called the land Guanahani which Columbus later dubbed or named San Salvador. So he cha changed the name into Spanish. But the Indians there had a name for it already that was called Guanahani. Uh, historians still argue about the precise or exact landing spot, but it was somewhere in the Bahamas. Okay, I'm gonna click to the next page. So it says here, Columbus 
miscalculated. Miscalculated means he made a mistake. If you're a mathematician, it's like me saying one plus one equals 11. Okay, that's not correct. So he made a mistake here. He miscalculated on his mapping. Columbus believed he had found Asia. But actually, he miscalculated the distance and a few other minor details. In fact, to say he misjudged would be an understatement, which means basically he made a big error. Some believe he underestimated Earth's size by 25%. Many people, including Columbus, thought the oceans were far, far smaller than they really are and that the land masses were much larger. His crew wasn't the least bit pleased, which means they were not happy at all, that their journey took as long as it did. There were rumblings of mutiny. So what that means, mutiny is when all the sailors are tired of the captain of the ship, or the admiral, they feel their life's in danger and they are thinking of putting the admiral or the captain in the jail on the ship and taking over the ship and saving their lives. So rumblings means there was a lot of talk that the men were thinking, this is taking too long. You know, what the hell is going on here? And if you talk to modern day sailors and giant aircrafts, fast uh, battleships, they will tell you the sea is endless. But at that time, most Europeans had not charted the seas. So they, and Columbus included, unfortunately believed that our land areas were larger and the sea was not that big. So as this journey took longer and longer and longer, the men were very, very unhappy. And Columbus was lucky that uh, the men did not put him in the uh, prison there and take over the ship. So continuing, uh, believing he landed in Asia or the Indies, meaning India, Columbus called the natives he encountered Indians. Again, he thought he was in India. Since he hadn't found the spices he was looking for, he kept sailing encountering Cuba and Hispaniola, which today they say modern day name is Haiti and the Dominican Republic. In a Christmas storm, the Santa Maria struck a coral reef, split open and sank. So one of the ships sank. Try to remember which one it was. Again, maybe that will come up on the midterm. But don't say, oh, the, the Del Taco ship sunk. Uh, you don't have to remember that it was Christmas Day though, okay? The exact location of the wreck is unknown, uh, but it is thought to be in the vicinity or location of today's Cap Haitian in Haiti. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my second set of questions here. Okay. Okay, so how's everybody doing? Everybody hanging in there? I hope so. This is a new format for all of us. So um, I'm just going to try to make it as easy for you and as comfortable as uh, possible. Okay. So these are the new questions from where we stopped the reading and, and I gave you the first questions from that time, this small part. These are the questions for this uh, reading. Okay. So let me write these down for you.
Okay, so question four. What did the king and queen of Spain offer the first sailor to sight land? Okay, so it's not like now, they didn't offer them a free ticket to Disneyland or Disney World, right? They didn't offer them uh, free dinner at, uh, <laughs> at Sizzler. Okay, they offered them quite uh, a lot of something. Okay, so try to remember what that was. Okay, now I'm gonna proceed to the next question. Question five. Okay, I'm getting used to this myself. Okay, question five. Uh, what did Columbus call? the first native people he met. Now, don't forget, they already had their own names. But remember, he was lost and he was confused. So he called them a name that he thought uh, he knew where they were from, but uh, it was incorrect. So see if you can remember. Uh, what he called them. Okay. okay, so, so far I hope that you think these questions are pretty straightforward, uh, nothing too complicated. Again, my job here is to uh, give you knowledge, right? Something you can easily remember that even um, American kids that went and had uh, US history in high school, they've forgotten. But hopefully you guys can uh, have that knowledge. All right, six. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything about this one because I think I talked a little too much on five, but why did he call them that meaning once you have the answer for five and you know what he called them, what's the reason why he did that, right? Why did he do it? And um, I'm thinking about adding an addendum to this, adding something next. Um, I'll give it a go. Yeah, this will make you search a little harder there. So I'll add this. Okay. What did they call themselves? They had their own original name for themselves, but uh, Columbus ignored that. It's, uh, I'll tell you like on the American continent, uh, said it became the United States, 
when the first Europeans met uh, or later be uh, categorized as American Indians, the first natives, uh, the translation of, of what they called themselves was just people, right? It wasn't actually a name like we are Mexicans or we are Koreans or we are Chinese. They just called themselves people. We are people. So history teaches you a lot of interesting things here. So again, I'll give you a few minutes to write these down. I know some people are slow, uh, slower than others. Hopefully no one's on their cell phone playing Candy Crush. Okay, so I don't want someone to say, oh, you know, the teacher, he just erased those questions too quickly. And, you know, I hadn't finished my Candy Crush, so it's the teacher's fault I didn't have all the questions. So I'm trying to give you uh, more time with uh, these questions. Okay, again, I'll go over it again. Four, what did the king and queen of Spain offer the first sailor to sight land? Something people still want today. What did Columbus call the first native people he met? And then why did he call them that? And the little extra one I threw in there, what did they call themselves? All right, so I think that uh, might be enough time that everybody can copy these questions. So I'm gonna have to erase these. Okay, taking a deep breath if you want to get up and stretch. Okay, do that. I don't have to go back to the uh, reading here. Okay, so I'm having a little tech technical difficulty here with the reading here. Okay. All right. All right, so uh, I'm on the next page here which uh, for you, uh, you'll have the page number on the bottom. So uh, you'll be on 13. I, I can't see it on my computer, but uh, you're on 13. Right, or should we be on? Yeah, we just did questions for page 12. We've done questions for page 11, 12, and this will be 13. Okay. All right, so the first colony, uh, Columbus didn't know what to do with the survivors of the Santa Maria. Again, hopefully you remember what happened to the Santa Maria. The Pinta wasn't nearby and the Nina, the smallest of the fleet, could not make room for the Santa Maria's crew. It would be too many men. It would force the Santa Maria to sink. So in the end, Columbus decided to leave behind 39 of his men to establish a colony he named La Navidad. 
which means Christmas. If you've heard the Spanish song they play at Christmas, Feliz Navidad, that means Merry Christmas. Uh, the first attempt at European settlement since the Vikings. If you remember, I mentioned earlier, they've more recently found artifacts buried in Newfoundland uh, and Canada that show that the Vikings were there actually before or predating Columbus, right? But after that, this is the first European settlement. Uh, and again, it was caused uh, by having to leave behind 39 of his men to establish a colony he named La Navidad. Okay. Some of them actually volunteered to stay behind in the Caribbean outpost. Among them were a surgeon, a barrel maker. If you don't know what a barrel is, if you've ever gone to a winery and you see those big round wooden, uh, let's call them things, right, that have the wine inside, those are barrels. Okay. An artillery, artillery man, which means a man that was an expert in guns, right, because they were afraid that maybe Indians might attack them and they needed some kind of weapons to protect themselves. And the tailor, we all know a tailor, a person who can sew your clothes uh, back together after you've put holes in them. And in addition to the many seamen who made up the crew, okay? Could you guess why a lot of people volunteered to stay? Because the Caribbean is a beautiful tropical island. Why do you wanna go back on a dirty ship, right? And maybe go back to, uh, Europe where they don't even have refrigeration and you have to use spices to make your meat last longer and taste better. Okay, so those were the folks on the first colony, okay? And uh, now we have the little teaser here in the middle, the essentials, okay? Uh, Columbus sailed home triumphantly bringing several Native Americans as proof of his successful expedition. Columbus made his way to the Portuguese king. Okay, I'm gonna stop there before I turn the page. I just wanna relate something to you, see if you understand this. First of all, you might not understand the word triumphantly. That just means successfully. People say, oh, he triumphed in his sport, which means he really succeeded. So I don't know if you caught this, but it says bringing several Native Americans as proof of his successful expedition. So he brought some of these people to Europe. Europe had no uh, Native people or Indian people at this time, and he brought them back. Um, the book here doesn't go into it, but I know a little uh, background on this. The people he brought to the Europe, they stayed. They never went back to the island. And uh, there's people today that can trace their family tree back to one or two, or maybe even three. Of the, he didn't bring many, he brought like a handful of these people. and. Uh, some of these Europeans who have the mixed blood are very proud to go back and say, hey, 400 something years ago, my father came from the island of Hispaniola. So I'm not only, let's say Italian, but I also have this blood too. And they're very proud. Uh, which brings me to ask a question. And uh, so far, I'm gonna relate this to a different situation. And so far, every person uh, from Korea that I've asked doesn't have an answer for me, doesn't have an idea. Uh, if my Korean students know who Hamil was, then you're gonna know what I'm talking about. Uh, he was from Holland and uh, around this time, his ship crashed in Jejido, where you see I'm filming right here from Jejido. So his ship crashed in Jejido, him and his men. Uh, he was made a prisoner there because the thinking at the time 
from the king of Korea was that if these strange foreigners land here, we should not let them escape. They must stay here. So he was kind of like a prisoner in Jejido, and he wrote a book about his time. Now, I haven't seen the book. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's uh, in Norwegian, maybe in Korean. I don't know. But I know Koreans know about this fellow. And all I could get was that he actually married a Korean woman. So my question is, is it possible, like here, with bringing the Indians to Europe, and later they married uh, European women, and they had descendants? I have yet to find out. I'm curious. Did Hamel have a baby with the Korean wife? Did she leave with him to go back to Holland? She would have been the first uh, Korean woman in Holland. So I don't know if she left, because I haven't read his book. I don't, I don't read Norwegian. Did she stay? Did he leave a child, a mixed child there in Korea? But all the Korean people I ask do not have an answer for me, sadly. So that would be something really interesting to uh, find out, okay? And uh, yes, like I said, I'm filming in Jejido. I have been to his ship. They made a replica of his ship in Jejido. It's really a neat, neat thing, really a, a pretty uh, ship. So if you get to Jejido, you sh I recommend that you go on the ship and it is uh, free, believe it or not. Okay. So again, reading here, Columbus made his way to the Portuguese king. Again, he's returning. The same monarch, again, monarch means king who refused to support the Admiral's voyage. So that's the title he had, Admiral, which is higher than captain, uh, before heading back to Spain. While in Lisbon, Lisbon is the capital of Portugal. Uh, he wrote a soon to be famous letter describing his Caribbean discoveries. And shortly thereafter appeared before Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. Okay. These European settlers discovered not only a new land, but new ways of living and eating as well. For instance, the Arawak Bahamas, they came from the islands of the Bahamas. And Taino, uh, I think the majority, from what I remember, um, were Taino people that he took to Europe. They didn't say that they chased, I saw the, 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 the paper. So they changed their, traced their lineage to the Taino people, not the Arawak. Uh, so the Arawak and Taino people slept in hand-woven hammocks or hammocks. If you don't know what a hammock is, it's uh, popular in Latin America. It's uh, made from rope and you tie it between two trees and you lie in it. People lie in it to relax, right? They lie in it to relax. And these folks could actually uh, sleep on it. So that's how they slept. They didn't sleep in the wooden European beds. And then Columbus men discovered a new diet of corn, which uh, some people call maize, sweet potatoes, and red chili peppers. And they learned to grow squash, pumpkins, and beans. So these things were from the new world. For example, people want to know, people want to know, hey, corn was not in the, uh, Europe. Pumpkins were not from Europe. Sweet potatoes were not from Europe.
Beans were not. Squash was not. Um, so, when people ask you that, you will know. Then, there was the botanical novelty. Novelty, a botanical means flowers or plants. Novelty is something new. The inhabitants smoked tobacco. Okay. So, tobacco also came from the new world. Right? Even though it's popular all over the world now, people smoke everywhere. Um, it is from or was from the New World. Uh, also, American Indians also smoked uh, tobacco. So that's where it came from. Next, in turn, Arawak people. learned how to farm with cattle, pigs, and horses, which Europeans later brought with them. However, the, no the novel, uh, excuse me, with the, <laughs> <laughs> However, with the novel comes the dreaded, which means with new things come bad things. Okay, so it's like we know now, like, for example, if you, if you go back to old uh, magazine and newspaper ads from, let's say, the 1930s or 1940s, and they have these pictures of John Wayne and other old uh, movie stars. Um, they're doing cigarette ads and they're saying, oh, how cigarettes are fresh and give you freshness. We had no idea about um, cancer, lung cancer, things like that. We had absolutely no idea but at that time, it was novel. It was a novelty. So they even promoted that it was good for your health. Now we know different. So here, however, the novel comes the dreaded, which means dreaded is very bad, something you really worry about. The Native Americans had no resistance to European diseases. And many succumbed, or meaning many died. Right? Two, and here we go. Smallpox, whooping cough. Uh, smallpox is a form of chickenpox. Most kids here get chickenpox. I don't know about it in your country. Whooping cough is a cough that you cannot stop. And it sounds almost like a horse. And you breathe in really heavily. And, <gasps> right? And you cough. <coughs> That's whooping cough. And uh, measles. Right? So what it means that they had no resistance is their immune system, the... Okay, I'll be honest with the European people, and especially these seamen, these uh, sailors, they um, were very dirty. Even, uh, you know the word filthy? They were filthy on the ships, and they had rats running around the ships. So um, they had been having these diseases, again, smallpox, whooping cough, and measles for many, many years. So. People get sick, people die, other people get it, survive, so they develop an immunity. So this was the first time uh, Native Americans had ever encountered these diseases that these seamen brought with them. They were pure, clean uh, folks. 
had uh, no medicine, no uh, immunity. So it just killed many, many of them, right? Same thing happened to when the first Europeans went to Polynesia, places like Hawaii. They were also really, really pure, strong, healthy people. Uh, and uh, like the natives, they were accustomed to bathing a lot. Uh, there's not much bathing when you're on a ship for six months and everybody's dirty, right? And traveling to the new world. So that's why a lot of them carried disease with them. But these other folks, they were just uh, too, too pure in their body structure. Uh, diseases brought to the Caribbean by the Europe Europeans contributed to the deaths, and here we go, of more than 3 million Native Americans between 1494 and 1508. Okay, so that's a terrible thing. Uh, so let me move on to the questions. For you, this will be page 13, okay? And, uh, let me go on to the questions here. Okay, all right, so again, hopefully you're hanging in there. Uh, just look at it like we're actually going a shorter time than if you were in class, we'd have to go over three hours. And here we're, we're having a shorter time. You're at home, hopefully you're relaxing with a nice drink or comfortable clothes and uh, you know, listening to my lecture here and we can uh, learn some things, okay? So, I'm on to question seven. Like I said, I'm getting used to this too. It's different. I usually just write on the whiteboard. Okay, again, technical difficulties here. I want to put his name in capitals here. So my first question, what was the name of the first, oh, let me make sure I get this out. Oh, well, teacher gave me an extra word here. Okay, just one time. Okay, you should start writing now so get ahead of the game here. Uh, but I will give you time to uh, write the questions. Um, what was the name of the first colony Christopher Columbus established in the New World? So remember, that's when so many men he nominated to stay on the island and uh, a lot of them volunteered, right? Because the one ship sank and then they 
could not take all of them on the other ship. So he gave it a name. So uh, I want you to try to write what you find as the name of the first colony. Okay, question eight. Okay, question eight is as follows. Uh, what were the new foods that Columbus discovered? Now there's a pretty good list. So I'll tell you like what I expect on the midterm. The more of these words on the list that you put or the more items that you write down, the more points I can give you. So if you have a student, writes one, one thing, and another student writes the total list, let's say maybe five items, I will give more points to the student that writes more. So that's just a way to let you know that, okay? So again, um, think about the foods that are very common now, but that actually Europe did not have at the time. I can tell you a comparable thing when uh, Hernan Cortez from Spain, uh, landed in Mexico and uh, met the Aztec people. The foods that he brought back to Europe were, and they're from Mexico, tomatoes. And uh, you might have some people argue with that and say, oh, well, Italian food. Well, before Christopher Columbus came back in the 1400s again, uh, there were no tomatoes. So I don't know what the Italians were using for sauce, but it wasn't tomatoes. He also brought back chocolate. A lot of people will say, no, 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 the best chocolate comes from Switzerland. But that's not where chocolate came from originally. It came from Mexico and it came from uh, the Aztecs. And it was made into a bitter drink that only the king or royalty could drink. Uh, Later, uh, fortunately, when it was brought to Europe, uh, the Swiss put uh, milk and uh, sugar and made the very tasty chocolates that we have today, but that was not the case. And another thing about the tomato, when the Spanish uh, first brought the tomato, it was brought before the Pope, yes, the Catholic Pope, and when Someone presented it to him and bit into the tomato. Uh, the Pope was shocked and exclaimed that it looked like blood. So it must be an evil uh, vegetable. So they were not able to actually use the tomatoes for a few years there until he was convinced that it was not evil. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, another thing that you might not know is uh, potatoes. Potatoes were actually brought from Peru. Okay, so think about these things on eight. It'll help you answer number eight. Okay, so I'm going to put question nine here. Okay. 
Okay, question nine is as follows. What did the Europeans teach the natives to do? They taught them to do something. So again, if you're not gonna do the reading or follow along, uh, don't put something funny like they taught them how to ride skateboards. There were no skateboards at the time. Or they taught them how to roller skate. There was no roller skates. So it's uh, pretty clear there in the reading what the trade-off was, the foods that he discovered through the Indians and then what the Europeans uh, taught them to do. I'll give you a hint, maybe with certain animals, okay? All right, so make sure you write that down. Then um, I'm going to write number 10, the last question for today. Everybody hanging in there? I hope so. It's, we're getting close to the end now. Hang in there. Be strong. All right? Okay, number 10, our last question for today's lecture and reading. What did the natives have no resistance to? Okay, uh, there was something that they had no power to defend against, okay? And again, might get some funny guys there, but we all say in the United States, men have no resistance to beautiful women, okay? But this is something more serious and more deadly for the natives uh, when they first met the, uh, I'll give you a hint, the dirty Europeans, okay? So that's question 10, that's your last one. So again, I'll give you a little more time to make sure you write all these down. Don't get angry that I erase it too quickly, okay? So take your time. Okay, is everybody doing okay? All right, so I'm gonna erase these now. Okay, now you're back to seeing me. Don't be scared, still me, okay? So we've gone through the reading material. Okay, so how nice I was able to put this up here. You do not have to buy the book. Uh, if Yishuan is in my class, she's usually the only student that makes it a hobby of buying the book. So let me see if it'll, you can see the title. If not, okay, here it is. Oh, it does, here, here we go. Kind of hard to see, huh? Wow. That's why I didn't use a whiteboard, I did the PowerPoint. So I'll just tell you the name, Everything, the Everything American History Book. Okay. 
That's the one I'm using. People, places, and events that shaped our nation. Uh, the author is John R. McGeehan. So that's a capital M, small c, capital G, E E H A N. Right. And um, trying to see here, because again, each one might want to buy it. It's uh, printed by Adams Media. Okay, it's, and I'm using the second edition. And if you truly are a stickler, Yixian, the uh, ISBN is uh, 10, semicolon, 159869-261-5. Okay, I know most of you are not gonna wanna buy it and you don't have to because I got the reading material here. But sometimes Yi Shen likes to collect books. So uh, that's for you in case you want to do that. Okay. So hopefully you will enjoy the class and uh, I'll make the reading enjoyable. And uh, we can learn things and remember them easily. Okay. And enjoy this online format. Okay. So I will see you next week and prepare uh, another lesson for you for the next week. So everybody take care, okay? I'll see you then, okay? Bye-bye.